Welcome. Uh, welcome to the uh, January 20th, 2012 meeting of the CSI BIM, BIM Practice Group. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Roger Grant and I'm one of the co-leaders of the practice group along with Bob Wygant and uh, we're welcoming a new member to our leadership group today, Beth Strochain. We're going to be having a presentation from Beth today, actually. Uh, so um, just a few things before we get started here. Uh, all of you, as I think the webinar told you, all of you attendees are muted so that um, you can't speak up directly, but we do encourage you to ask questions and join into a discussion with us. Uh, there's a couple ways to do that. You can either type a question into the question log or you can uh, actually uh, raise your hand using the control in GoToWebinar and we can unmute you so that you can speak and uh, please uh, feel free to do that. We, we encourage you to dialogue with us. Um, uh, we'll uh, ask Beth here in just a minute if she wants to take questions through the middle of her presentation or if she wants to wait till the end. But uh, uh, please feel free to ask questions. <clears throat> uh, let's see, um, can you all see my screen? It says the CSI BIM practice group, putting the I in BIM. No. I cannot see that one, Roger. Okay, well, that's a good place to start then. Let me see if uh, I'm sharing my screen. I think I am. Uh, stop showing application. Uh, it says I'm showing an application. Uh, but maybe. Uh, let me try this approach and see if that. Does. There it is. Okay, now you can see it? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, um, let's see, just before we start, a word or two about the BIM practice group. Um, those of you who have been faithful members of this group for a while have noticed that we've been on a bit of a hiatus. Uh, we've uh, been regrouping, so to speak, after a run of the practice group uh, led by myself and, and Bob Wygant. Uh, we've uh, been looking to get some more people involved and Beth has joined in with us now, so we're, uh, we're, we're starting up another run and we're looking here in 2012 to have regular meetings of the practice group. Um, and uh, uh, today, I'm going to move to the next slide. Today we're going to um, hear a presentation from Beth and uh, um, then we see going forward with a little series here on specifications and, and BIM and uh, Beth's going to give us an overview on that topic but then we're going to look to get some more specific presentations from some of the tools uh, providers that are out there or from um, from people that are using the tools and actually that's the direction we're trying to go in is get some users of these tools to talk about what they're doing. So to that end, we would ask that any of you who are interested and are using either eSpecs or BSD or RCOM, MasterSpec or uh, any other tool and would be willing to share about that to uh, send us a note through the, uh, the question or the chat here with your contact information so we can talk to you about that. Uh, let's see, Bob, anything you want to uh, add to my preamble before we get going? Um, no, not, not specifically. The only thing I did want to point out, which you, you had mentioned, was um, that you know, after, after uh, you know, I guess three years of the BIM practice group, um, we decided to move it to a panel-based discussion so that we're going to have more, more people. Uh, we're looking to get more people involved so there's you know, three, four, five people um, on a panel, one being the presenter, and then a few people that are that are either knowledgeable in uh, knowledgeable with the uh, specific topic, or just interested in sharing their thoughts. Um, and it's not something that is a a long term commitment. 
it's just if you're interested in sitting on a panel for any one of the upcoming topics, please let us know. If you if you're interested, you know, in uh, talk, you know, you have some experience in DSD, and there's a presentation that is coming up, uh, and you, you'd be interested in being a panelist. Please let us know, and we can you know we can look into adding you to the panel. And that's sort of the format that we're going with at this point is you know we're sort of you know rolling the leadership around uh, so that everybody kind of takes a turn, uh, getting a little bit more involved and start to make make some decisions for themselves as to if they want to get more involved or if they just want to be sort of to the side or if they just want to listen. So it's you know it, it becoming a part of the panel doesn't mean that you have to be there every month. It doesn't mean that you have to be there. Um, you know it doesn't mean that you have things that you need to do other than to just share your experience uh, at, at one or more given topics coming up. And um, that's, that's, that was pretty much what I wanted to kind of get across with, with the concept of moving from, from uh, Roger and myself uh, leading this group to moving into a panel so that we can all kind of work into, uh, work into uh, leadership. <coughs> Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks for elaborating on that, Bob. That's a good way to think about it as a panel-led uh, group. That's what we're really trying to achieve. So for today, there's three of us, but any of you that are out there that want to speak up, just uh, let us know, raise your hand. I'm going to make Beth the presenter now and introduce Beth Strashane of ZGF Architects, who's a, a certified construction specifier and does a lot of work with uh, specifications and has used a lot of the automated tools that are out there uh, and is going to share with us her view on automating the specification process in conjunction with uh, working with building information model. Um, Beth, um, welcome and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say and I'll let you uh, let people know how you want to deal with uh, questions if you want people to interrupt or hold to the end. Well, hello. My name is Beth Strochane, and I'm out in Seattle, and we are digging out of snow, less snow than most people probably have, but more than we're used to dealing with. Um, I think taking questions through the presentation is easier, just because it's a complex subject, and it's easier to ask eSpecs questions when I'm talking about that, rather than wait till the end and try to remember what we were talking about. Um, I'm really good at using the ask a question in the box by typing, and I can add that into the presentation. Um, the raise your hand and ask a question is a little more challenging. And so if we want to raise hands, I'll uh, pause at a couple points and say, are there any questions that need more than um, quick type in the text box and bring in longer questions there. But other than that, type questions in the uh, text box and that comes up on my screen and I can answer that as I go. And so with that, can you guys see my screen? BIM and spec software, what is on the market? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so with that I'm going to get started. My name's Beth Strochan and I came to the BIM practice group asking for, um, I want to know what other practitioners are doing. I want to know where the industry is. And they said, well, how about you start? So I, I bought myself the position to start talking about what practitioners are doing and how things um, are moving in the industry so that we can all learn from each other and help our industry move forward. So with that, like um, I was introduced, I'm a certified construction specifier. I've been doing big projects in eSpecs and BSD for years. And so the, the myth that they're not there yet and you can't do big projects isn't true. Um, and the other important thing is I am the specifier. I work in a large firm with architects and projects that change and projects that evolve. And so dealing with real-world workflow problems is happening. So I'll go through how that works. My motto on um, software is break it early and break it often. And if you don't push it to its limits and break it, the software people can't fix it and make it evolve and make it better. 
So sitting at home and saying, yeah, this isn't there yet, uh, I heard it doesn't work, isn't going to move the industry forward. So rather than talk about a specific piece of software, we're going to look at what is on the market and what do they say that it does versus what does it really do. And I'm going to figure out how to advance my slides. Oh, I rolled my mouse. Beautiful. So let's start with my presenter bias. The only modeling software I've ever used is Revit. The specification software I've used are Microsoft Word, ADM Symphony, which is no longer on the market but has some brilliant features, eSpecs, BSD Speclink, and AlterX. AlterX is also not on the market yet. It's still in beta. So what are we going to look at? Are we there yet? Is the software there yet? Um, we're going to look at assumptions. We're going to look at what are we comparing? How do they compare on features? What are the out-of-the-box language differences? How language is updated? The ease of editing? Can you link specifications to specifications? Can you link specifications to models? And keynoting, which is a new thing that's starting to um, hit the market and be discussed as a feature. Do they provide value to your work? And can you BIM your specifications without the software? And I think the answer is yes. So the software, does it do what you assume it does based on what is advertised? And do you do what the software assumes that you do? And those are the things that cause the breakdown where someone will have the, the software and say, this doesn't do um, what you said it does. And the reason it doesn't do what you said it does is because you don't act like the software assumes that you act. So what are we going to be comparing? Microsoft Word, eSpecs, AlterX, BSD Speclink, and add that links to Revit software. So features, features, features. The variability of the features in the software is huge. This isn't a toilet paper comparison like you trade off a little more cost for a little more softness and absorbency, or you can cut the cost and not have quite so much absorbency, but the features being the same. This is more of a comparison like vehicles, a sedan versus a motorcycle versus a full-size truck. If you want towing capacity, you wouldn't even look at a motorcycle because they don't have towing capacity. And so looking at what features exist within the software is going to steer you towards one software and away from another because it's not equal comparison of features. And I think this is something that, P that is often not realized. So why Microsoft Word? Why are we even talking about this piece of software on a BIM presentation? Microsoft Word can be used to do many things that the BIM software on the market can do. You can auto-format, you can link to components of Revit, you can do hyperlinking. There's a lot of things that you can do in Microsoft Word. And so, in my opinion, anything that Word can do shouldn't be a selling feature in, micro in, um, so in a BIM software. So, what are the software companies saying? This is straight from their website. eSpec says, for Revit interface, you can, with Revit's parametric database, instantly update your project specifications to the requirements of the building model. Insert a wall, door, window, or any other building object into your Revit model and instantly update your project manual with the appropriate specifications. Any changes you make to the design will automatically be incorporated into the specification manual. Click the mouse, you can access all the un other functionality that eSpecs provides to update your specifications on the fly. Post project notes, view section markups, and more. That's what eSpecs does. Notice lots of automatic and click of a button. BSD. Welcome to the new world where your specifications automatically integrate with BIM created in Autodesk Revit. Building System Design proudly introduced Linkman E. And here is it's a set of dashboards. Linkman E uses interface as a set of dashboards together comprising a monitoring station that permits a project manager to view the status of project development in the linked applications. So those aren't the 
same thing, although lots of automatic. Alt-Rex, very similar, fully integrates with master set, creates and automatically updates Office Master's sleek, easy to use interface. So automatic formatting. Every piece of software talks about this. Microsoft Word, yes, you can automatic format anything with or without Masterworks. Masterworks is a suite of macros that comes with Arcom's um, masters, but you can write macros and use Word to auto format your documents. So X, yes, you can auto format with some restrictions. Linkman and Speclink, yes, you can auto format with some restrictions. And Alterx, yes, you can auto format with some restrictions. So in my opinion, this shouldn't be a selling feature. If you just want auto formatting, go hire someone to write you some macros and leave the spec Vim software alone. So out of the box language, what language do you want to use? Microsoft Word, you can put any language in there you want. You can use RCOMs, you can use BSVs, whatever you want your specs, whatever you're used to using. Specs uses master spec. They can use Veterans Affairs um, and your custom masters. Speclink and Linkman uh, uses building system design, BSD's language, and custom masters. Alterx uses custom masters and master spec. So about those custom masters, everyone advertises that they're completely automatic, but they also advertise that you can do custom masters. The only thing that's automatic is what comes out of the box. So if you use master specs language out of the box without any edits, and you use Revit components that come with your Revit software out of the box without any edits, automatic things happen. But if you edit anything, if you create a set of custom masters or a custom set of components because they don't have all the components that you need, that's where the automatic ends. You can automate it by you putting in lots of effort, but it doesn't come out of the box that way. And so there is a huge amount of effort at some point if you have custom things. It can be done. The software exists to do it, but it takes effort. So language updating, eSpecs, if you've got, if you start with Arcom's masters that come with eSpecs and you update them in any way, you add your abbreviations or your favorite paragraphs to those customized sections, you have to manually update them. They come in as a Word file and you have to do a document compare to see how this tile section is different than the last tile section and you have to and paste it in there. Or you can say update it back to Arcom's master, which will eliminate all of your customized edits. And so that amount of effort to update that is huge. Linkman and Speclink, customized masters are a click of a button. Even if you're within your existing project, I've got a hospital project that I've been developing the specs on for two years, and BSD comes out with an update. I can open my hospital project, and I can see from different colored columns which text has been updated, and I can right-click and say, what did it used to be? What is it now? And do I want to accept that? That's available to every single ongoing project and your master's. And standard masters, if you haven't updated it, are automatic. Alterx is customized masters, and I've been told are updated with limited user interaction. I'm not sure what that means. In the beta version that I tested, it didn't include that, but it's in the later beta version, so we're waiting to see how that works. Um, and standard masters from master spec language has is automatic update. So what it takes to build it and what it takes to update it as life goes on are two big things that change. How do you edit? Things that you would think just work um, don't necessarily work. So copy, paste, etc. like you do um, to pull 
language that you love from one job into the next job. In Word, you just copy three paragraphs and articles and you paste them in. Well, with eSpecs, line by line, it works great. Like a full paragraph by a full paragraph, it works great. But it gets a little funky when you try to do whole articles, a series of paragraphs of different um, paragraph levels. Articles, paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three. Um, and spell check, I couldn't get it to work consistently. These are things that I just assumed would work. And that isn't the case. So these are crutches that I've had to learn to live without. Um, Speclink is very similar. You can do lines and articles, but it gets a little funky if you try to do multiple articles. And spell check is much more consistent. Alterx, you can copy and paste or edit paragraphs at a time, but not two paragraphs at a time. Spell check is included, but I haven't seen how it works. So these are things that if these are things that are really important to you, you need to know how they work. That you may assume work, but don't. And as a caveat, the reason they don't work is because these are all database softwares. It isn't a, if you take a Word document, all of the text in a Word document is essentially in a single box. And you can interact with that any way that you want because you're playing in a single box. With databases, each paragraph is a different box. That's how you get the power because you can link boxes to boxes. But trying to copy six boxes and paste them into the middle of 12 boxes gets things um, acting strangely. And that is a function of the database. And so figuring out how to work with databases is something that's ongoing. So ease of review by the team. Who can see what when and what, how do they interact with it? So with eSpecs, the team can see the mark of, a, of the specification from within Revit or an eSpec desktop, which is a little piece of software that's free that a project manager who doesn't know anything about Revit can log in and look at the specs. All of the specs like they're looking at a, a printed out manual, only it's online. They see the latest printed edit. And from within Revit, if you've got a stair that is linked to a stair section and a paint section, you can right click on that component and say show me the specs to see what kind of stair do I, or what kind of railing do I have specified. Is it aluminum or stainless steel or what is that? And they can interact with the spec and write on the top, oh, you've got this wrong. This needs to be aluminum instead of stainless steel. That can happen from within Revit with these specs. With Linkman, and Speclink, the team must have the full version of the software to see anything that hasn't been exported. So that's the difference of a free piece of software on everyone's machine to look at specs versus a not remotely free piece of software on everyone's machine to look at specs. And so just the accessibility. And there's no way for people within Revit to see the specs with Linkman. Alterx, the team has to have the full version of software to see the unexported documents. And all of these softwares, the um, specifier working within them can say export and dump them out to Word files. But then it's disconnected from the database, and they can be out of date from the database. So linking between sections, linking the bathtub section to the bathtub sealant in your sealant section. So if you ever have bathtubs, you will have bathtub sealant. Um, that's a feature that only Speclink has. You can link one section to paragraphs in another section or a bunch of paragraphs all together. eSpecs can link multiple para or multiple spec sections to a single component, but can't link one spec section text to another spec section. And Alteryx, I haven't seen that this is available at all. So can we link to models? This is what everybody's super excited about. Linking to models means that I am all bimmed up. I am all ready to go, and I can tell my clients that we are there. So eSpecs, the model is linked to the specification database. 
and model components are linked to specification paragraphs with assembly codes and parameters. That is the key. You have a number code embedded in your Revit component that say, when I exist in your model, turn on this spec section. And those um, assembly codes are uniformat based when they come out of the box from Revit. I suppose you could make them anything from colors of uniforms to anything else, but to follow the industry, they are uniformat. So that is pushing on uniformat to get more um, more technical or more broken down and stratified so that you can actually deal with all the teeny tiny components. And once those are linked, the model information is pushed to, specific, pushed to the specification database and it says, okay, what uniformat assembly codes do I see? Okay, those spec sections turn on. That's the, the vehicle with which it works. Spec link, the model is linked to the specification database. And then the list of model components can be viewed on the same dashboard as the list of specification sections. And it says, okay, you've got a green box over here and no box over here. That means that you've got a spec section and no component. And then you go down further and you say, okay, I've got a green box on the Revit side and no box on the spec side, which means I have a component with no spec section. And you can link those together so that every time you look at it, you can say, okay, I have 200 disconnects the first time I look at it, and then I link some things together, so the next time I look at it, I've only got 20 disconnects. So I can see the 20 things that happened since I last looked at it. And the user can link them together and turn them on from there. And I haven't seen how Alterx works with this. And in fairness, Alterx is still in beta. It hasn't hit the market. And that's something that as you use all of these softwares, you'll realize that Speclink has been working in databases for 10 or 15 years. eSpecs has been working in databases for 8 or 10 years. And Alterx is starting to play in databases right now. And so how sophisticated the interaction with databases and using that power is evident in how old they are. So keynoting. This is something that's been a hot topic lately. The interesting thing is, is that it seems to be a hot topic with everyone except architects. Most architects I say, hey, guess what, we can keynote. And they like get this big eyed look and run the other way. Um, and I figured that, figured that out because everyone's terrified of conduct. I don't want a big series of numbers that I don't know what are all over my drawing. The cool thing about Revit is it will allow you to see a whole bunch of numbers, if that's your thing, or you can do numbers and text, or you can just do straight text. So if you just want to use straight text, you can use the power of keynoting without seeing the Condoc numbers ever on your drawings. So that's something that that is we're bringing people around to. And Revit is helping with that a lot because you can toggle between those things. Um, so eSpecs, the text within the specification can be designated as a keynote. So you put, around, put a little box around the text and you say, this is a keynote. And then it will show up in the keynote file. And then you export the TXT file and it can be read by the Revit model. So if I screwed something up and made a keynote something that was misspelled, I could fix the spelling in the specification. I could re-export out the document, and then it would the spelling correction would be made in every place that that keynote existed in the model. So there's a great power there. You can edit things quickly. You can edit things globally. You can fix things globally. Well, with power comes danger. I could just as easily change every locker note into something that says red dog everywhere in the model, and there would be no question. So that's something that it allows you to do. It allows you to match the terminology, but there's also some risk with that. The, the thing that I'm excited about is the situation that we run into regularly 
is we start out the uh, project with terracotta cladding. Everybody loves terracotta cladding. So SD, there's terracotta cladding notes everywhere. So then we go through the first BE process and terracotta cladding disappears and now we have insulated metal panel or slate. Just other cladding systems. And through CDs, I'm still finding reference to terracotta cladding. With the keynoting system, if we turn off the terracotta cladding section, the terracotta cladding keynote disappears. And where it was keynoted to terracotta cladding, it will now be question marks, as it should be. What should this say now, now that the terracotta cladding is gone? And so that is part of the power of it. Linkman is just getting into keynoting. When I wrote this, it wasn't available out of the box, but it's part of Linkman now, and I haven't seen its latest rendition. But the ability to link between spec sections has allowed us at our office to create a spec section that is a keynote file. And as sections turn on, the link between the sections turns on and off those keynote those key Thinking of everybody spellbound. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's terrified now. <laughs> I think we're all quite impressed with your command of the different intricacies of these uh, packages. Well, it's one of those geek things that I kind of like um, exploring and figuring things out. <clears throat> um, so then we're back to the assumptions. This is where we run into trouble. So. We but have did all we, the did, I guess, uh, wait, Beth, before you do go, I, I don't, do we have anybody that wants to ask anything or say anything? I guess. Uh, I'm seeing a few questions coming in now. So, hang on a second, let me open up this pane. And see if, okay, good job. Uh, keep going. Uh, how hard is it to learn each one of the software? How far what? How hard is it to learn each one of these different pieces of software? Um, it follows the 80-20 rule. You can get to 80% pretty fast. Um, and that last 20 is lots of trial and error and stumbling and figuring out how it works with your workflow. Right. Well. Okay, you know, when you say pretty fast, I mean, it, from from your expertise in, in playing with each of these different pieces of software, how long did it take you to get to that 80%? A couple of weeks, a couple uh, of months? I've been minutes. using, I've been using BSD to the level that I'm at for about six months. Okay. Um, and it took me about two weeks to be more than dangerous. So learning how it works and learning to link things together and how does this work and how does that work um, took me about two weeks. Okay. And That's each step is, it is a similar kind of thing. But it's a, it takes your whole brain focused on something for two weeks to figure out how it works. And I have pages and pages of notes about, okay, so how did this work? And I have to write notes to myself or I'll never remember. And mm -hmm. so it takes your brain figuring it out. Okay. And then we have um, uh, just a comment that version 6.0 in eSpecs cha changes several of the previous points that you had brought up. Excellent. Um, yeah, I might add that we would have offered to, uh, we'd like to offer somebody from eSpecs a chance to talk to us about that in the future. So hopefully it'll be someone that's using it, uh, not just someone from the company, but we'd like to get maybe both. 
And, and I haven't used eSpecs personally for almost a year. But before that, I did many large projects with eSpecs. Okay. Um, and then uh, with respect to out-of-the-box functions you mentioned, having, or you mentioned having to create links between the model code and the specifications in eSpec. Um, are they linked, uh, are the links automatic? If you use um, out-of-the-box Revit components, they come with uniformat assembly codes. And if you use out-of-the-box RCOM masters, eSpecs has embedded, um, has auto-linked them to out-of-the-box Revit components. And so some stuff will turn on. Is it the stuff that you would expect to turn on? I don't know. But things will turn on. So there is some automation, but you need to look at what happens. Just like you would look through a standard set of master language and say, yeah, I don't agree with that paragraph. I'm going to turn it off. And just like some people will put the paint for their um, stair section in the paint section, and so they would link two sections to the stair, other people will put the paint for the stair section in the stair section, and so you would only link to one section. And so those are kind of the things that, that are office to office different. And the only thing the software companies do, can do is shoot for the middle. Mm -hmm. And hope they okay. hit the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should let that keep going now, huh, Bob? So. Yeah, no, by all means. She, I don't know how much more she has. But. OK, so we'll get to the some other things of, of where we're going. That was a lot of the features. So back to assumptions. There's some assumptions that software makes about how we as practitioners function. So it's January. You've been to. Um, You've been drinking Vente Mocha's for the entire last year, decide you want to lose a couple pounds, so you decide, I'm only going to get tall Mocha's from now on. So, fine, great. So, how do, you, how do you do that? So, you go to Starbucks, and I'm from Seattle, so everybody goes to Starbucks, and you are not thinking you're playing with your smartphone, and you accidentally order a Vente Mocha. Great. How do you change your order? If I'm in Starbucks and I want to change my order, I would say, I'm sorry, I want to change my order to a tall mocha. The software assumes that that's how you make changes in your models. But that's not my experience with how our people make changes in models. They say, I want a vente. They get halfway up and they say, no, I've changed my mind. I want you to scale that down. 25.6%. So I'm not going to change it out. I'm not going to take out one component and put in another component. I'm going to squash it till it looks right. The problem with squashing it till it looks right is the information embedded in it still says Vente Mocha, even though it's Vente Mocha scaled down 25%, which isn't remotely the same thing. And so that's where part of the assumption breaks down is we don't function the way that the software assumes that we're going to function. And then we're to, do, does the software provide value to your work? And that's something you have to think about as, do you want to do the same thing? Do you want to write specs exactly the way that you've written specs for the last 20 years? Or do you want to do something different? Because if you want to write specs exactly the way you have the last 20 years, none of these softwares is going to make you faster. There's some argument with that. Um, but do, starting with a new piece of software and expecting it to do and act exactly like what you've used before um, is not going to happen. There's no way that they can make a database software as smooth and seamless as Word, as fast as you can make it work now. So, but if you're trying to do something different, then you need to look at what you're trying to do and see which one of the features helps you get there. 
So can you BIM your specs without the software? That question is answered by what's your definition of BIM for your specs? You can write specs without the software. You can get the language without the software. You can get RCOM or BSD's language. You can format without them. You can see what's in the models without them by running a schedule from Revit and just turn on the sections that you always turn on. You can have consistent terminology without them. You can, some offices can pull off conduct. Some offices print out a list of terminologies. They here, write this on the drawings. Um, and there's just different processes for dealing with those. You can keynote without them. You can write a TXT file. And teams can see markups of specs within Revit without them by linking a PDF hyperlink to your Revit components. You can see the specs and mark them up. It just boots you out to a, a FTP site. So all of those things are easier with this software. Whether it's BSD or eSpecs, they're all easier with the software. You can build on what you learned before and you can make the next job faster. The challenge with that is you have to learn to drive it because it's a completely different animal. You could be really brilliant at pushing wheelbarrows and push it faster than anybody else, but if you don't know how to drive a stick shift, you can't drive a cat wagon. And so learning how to drive is something that's of vital importance to figuring it out and put in the time for learning to drive. So even if you learn to drive, and this is something that I'm running into, is what delivery quantity and schedule is the next person in the process equipped to deal with? What's the contractor, whether it's Turner or Skanska or anybody else, used to dealing with? They're used to dealing with paper. And I've been in many meetings where I said, okay, so I've got all of this information. What, what do you want from, what would be the most effective thing that you want from me? Um, yeah, that would be paper, and we'd love you to export out of some middle schedule so we don't have to retype it. You can do that with Word files. And so know that even if you learn to drive, you will no longer be the weakest link, but there will be someone else that is. And that's just moving the industry forward. So the problem is, is if no one ever learns to drive and waits for everyone else to learn first, no one's going to move the industry past shovels. We'll still be using Word files because no one's bothering to learn how to use something that's harder than what they're doing now. And once you get over the initial learning curve, it can be much faster. Sorry? And so if I could pick and choose, if I could dice up all the features and say whose feature is best at what, um, this is what I do. Out of the box language, I choose RCOM. I love basis of design and their consistency. Um, and the ability to have this and that, and that's what I use most. So if I could choose, that's what I would choose. Um, other people choose differently, but that's just me. Um, language updates, BSD. Hands down, they are the winner. The ability to see updates in your ongoing projects is brilliant and essential. We have projects that take three years to get out the door. And so you essentially lose three years of updates if you're in RCOM. Or you have to hire someone to put that updated tile installation guidelines, because now the TCNA addresses lippage, um, in every single one of your ongoing projects. And if you've got a large firm, that task is daunting. Um, ease of editing, BSV. Uh, they are a couple iterations ahead of the others at this point, and I think that that's purely time that they've been working with uh, databases. So linking within specification, BSD is the only one that does this, and it makes advanced things possible. And if I'm doing the advanced BSD presentation later this year, then I'll talk about what we've been able to pull off because of linking within specification. Um, linking to models, eSpec has it. Seeing and marking up the specs from within Revit is so great. The ability to say this component that you're placing in the model is linked to this information and they are one thing is hugely advantageous. 
to being able to explain how things work. It breaks 500 pages of specifications that are six inches tall into three pages at a time, and that's way more digestible for the people building models. Keynoting at this point is a close race. Just depends on what you're trying to do. And status, Alteryx has a way to set status on all of your sections so you can remember where you are. I get to the point where I can't remember stuff, and did I edit this tile section or not, and did I get cleared through waterproofing or not, and I lose track. I've embedded something custom into BSD that will allow me to do that, but Alteryx has that feature figured out at this point. So what is missing, and why is it important? What's nobody doing that I truly wish someone would do? Tracking changes. The ability to keep our projects in the database after the first official issuance to the contractor. Nobody tracks changes. They, they'll, it'll show you on screen what you've deleted. Espex does. It'll show strikeouts. And you need to see what changed between A and B, between DD 50% and DD final, because we're working with the contractors that early. So why does that make a difference? The reason that makes a difference is because we are out of the database in Word files during the highest learning point of the project. So when I learn that my reference to G120, galvanizing 120 in my hollow metal framing section is just dumb, I'm not in the database where I can put that back into my master. I'm off in a Word file and at least 50% of the time I will forget to go put that back in my master. And there's no way for me to put it into my ongoing projects. So I'm going to be dumb there, and I'm going to be dumb 10 other times before I get it fixed. And I try to avoid being dumb as much as possible, especially when I know I'm being dumb because I do it accidentally a lot. So that feedback loop is broken. And so truly wish that that was coming down the pipe and I haven't heard yet. So push users or pushing user text to the ongoing projects. BSD can do this with their updates. So I can see what BSD language has changed since the last update. But I can't, like with that example of my G120, I can't fix that in my master and push it to my ongoing projects. So when I open them, I get a reminder, or a, a tag that says, oh, guess what? You changed this in your master. That doesn't exist now. I truly wish that it would. Um, because if I learn something important, there's no good way to get all that information to my ongoing projects. I always miss some, and that's just people being people. And the last thing is export something contractors can use, and I don't know what that is other than really coordinated spec documents at this point, and the ability to run reports that tell me what all my submittals are. So. I'm still trying to figure out from um, contractors what's the best thing that we can export and what can they use. And so those are the things that I hope are coming. And what I ask all of you that are interested in this industry is we need to learn to drive our industry before it drives away from us because that's what's going to happen. We have to, because it's, it's changing. We need to learn how to be in the future because we can't hold it in the past much longer. And that's the end of the slide. If anyone has any more questions or comments or wants where I screwed it up and have misquoted someone's features. Because I do that occasionally, but I try not to. Well, and, and also, Beth, uh that we do want to try to get some presentations for, that are coming from people using the other tools that are more, you know, you've told us a lot of summary information, and then maybe we can get some that are showing, well, here's exactly how I do this and what it looks like when you link a specification class to a Revit object or do a global update or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, that, <clears throat> So I keep that point in everybody's mind. Um, so I guess a few more questions and comments have come in on the uh, on the on the chat window. Um, 
I'm not sure where we left off. Um, one thing you mentioned someone's can, bringing up here. Up oh, okay, Bob. I was just going to point out this one thing that I think you mentioned, Beth, was uh, about how you can uh, work or work in a team or outside of a team and share things and what you have to have. I guess you had a slide that talked about that, right? That you on some of the packages, everybody has to own the package and some things you can share through Revit. Right. Or you have um, to export we've... snapshots, I guess, as as Word files or something if you want someone else to edit them. Yes. So within the database, if people want to just read and mark up, there is a free piece of software with eSpecs that will allow you to do that. And you can also do that within Revit because they have a plugin for Revit that will allow you to do that. You can't actually edit the specs, but you can write notes on the top of them and the specifier can see them from within eSpecs and pick them up. Mm -hmm. So instead of a pile of 10,000 sticky notes, you get um, everything organized within your database that you can see side by side on your screen. And that's not available with any of the other software. Okay. Um, we want me to go into into the questions. There's only a few of them. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, is there is there any way an independent specification consultant can work with these systems and architect using Revit? Does the specifier have to be in office? Um, I think the answer is yes, and I think the specifier has to lead and know what the software is and know what the architects have to do because just saying, okay, I'm going to work with this software and link things together, let me rephrase that. If an independent specifier wants to link to models, they're going to have to really learn the software and really do a lot of training. If they want to do their specifications faster and have the ability to link to models, an independent specifier could do this. Um, BSD for sure will allow you to really organize how things work together and maintain more than one set of masters a lot more effectively than within Word files because you can see as language is updated and you can run keynote files like we figured out how to do. You can run keynote files for different jobs and all kinds of things that you can use to coordinate with your architects. If I, was, if I went independent, and I'm not planning on doing so, um, I would use BSD because I could run keynote files and all kinds of things out of it um, and keep masters updated more effectively. Okay. Uh, what software are you, are you using now and why? I'm currently using BSD and I like and I chose to use BSD because the updating is manageable. Before I was using eSpecs and we spent a lot of effort when I was at a previous firm getting a set of masters all updated or all set up with all of our edits and everything and then got to the point of, okay, now we have this update from Arcom and how are we going to deal with it? Oh, well, they updated 25 sections. And it would take a full-time job to keep that updated. And that is a huge, daunting task that I don't want. So that's why. And the ability to link um, sections to sections uh, gives me the power to do some things that eSpecs doesn't allow me to do. Okay. Um, do you find that a lot of contractors use BIM software? Do what? Do you find that a lot of contractors use BIM software? Um, not spec BIM software. Okay. I've worked with a lot of contractors that use Revit, 
and Navis and other modeling software, but I haven't seen any of them that even know what to do with SpecSim software. Okay. And um, how do you deal with bad information? This is probably going to be our last question because we're out of time, but I, I like this one. How do you deal with bad information on the Revit model? If the model assembly is just wrong, how do you correct that via the spec? That's one of the things that everybody's trying to figure out is the value that linking the model to the specs provides is worth the effort of fixing all of those errors. And right now, with even with all the knowledge that I have, I don't know that the value is there yet. Trying to get 25 modelers on a great big job to change their workflow, to quit using a curtain wall panel squashed and stretched to be a pharmacy window, <laughs> isn't there yet. I mean, I can look through the drawings, I can run a schedule and say, okay, what do we have? And I might miss the pharmacy window, but me missing the pharmacy window is not as much cost as retraining a whole bunch of modelers at this very moment. And so that's something where you're balancing workflow and effort and standing right here today, I don't have enough value to the point that I could stand up and say, we need to model exactly this way because these are the benefits that you would get and the value you would get for making that change. And so I've gotten to, on many occasions, been all excited about the next software and say, okay, we're going to do this, we are excited, and I run a dump out of a Revit model and say, okay, I've got a landlock TI, I know that that's the scope of the job, and I've got my curtain wall section turned on, I've got my um, roofing section turned on, curtain wall because of the pharmacy window, roofing section because they used EPDM something or other from Revit to make tile underlayment. Um, I've got just random stuff that I know bricks because they used um, the brick pattern as a wall covering pattern. And so that kind of thing is something you really have to look at. What's the value and what's it going to cost you? Pass on that uh, provocative closing statement. <clears throat> I'm going to say that we've reached the end of our time. Uh, I want to thank you very much for this presentation. I think it's been very, very interesting and very, uh, very good. You've done a great job and uh, I think you've kept everybody's attention and interest. Uh, and because of that, maybe you'll all come back and join us next month when we continue this topic. Uh, remember our request to join our panel send an email or type in the chat window right now if you think you want to help present or help with the, the question and answers next month. We're going to try and get one of the other uh, tools that Bess talked about and go into a little more depth with it next month. Uh, next month we're planning to meet on the 17th. Is that right, Rob? Sorry, I was just uh, just muted there. Yeah, I believe that's correct. Okay, February 17th at the same time. So we'll be sending out invitations, but mark it on your calendar. Um, if you do want to get a hold of any of us, there is contact information. Uh, and uh, um, we appreciate all of your joining, all of you for joining us today. We found this to be interesting, and uh, come back next month. Beth, thanks again. Fantastic job. Thank you. Have a good day. Take care, everyone. Yay. Bye, all. Ta-ta.